talking to here today is some research that Arbor has sponsored with the Economist Intelligence Unit. And that research was all about assessing how ready organisations are to deal with cybersecurity incidents. What we looked at was you know, how they prepared, what they've done, what they haven't done, where they were most confident in their preparations, where they were least confident. And we also asked them about you know, how they felt they could better prepare to deal with the you know, threats that faced them and the incidents that they were actually experiencing. Um, and as I'm sure everybody here, you know, that can appreciate, there are a lot of cybersecurity incidents going on out there. And, you know, the costs can be very significant to get these kinds of things wrong. Before I go into this um, in detail, though, I'd like to start off today um, with a brief introduction to our networks. For those of you who don't know us, don't know what we do, and um, so you kind of understand why we're interested in this kind of thing. Um, then I'd like to look briefly at where the data has come from. How the economist got hold of the information for this research. And then what I'd like to do is go through the key findings from the research. And what I'm going to do is go through those key findings first at a fairly high level, uh, and then I'm going to drill down into each of them so that you can see more of the raw data and understand how we actually extracted those key findings. And then finally today, I'm going to look at some conclusions from the research, and we're going to talk a little bit about how ARBA can potentially help organisations deal with some of those conclusions. So, Firstly, a quick introduction to Arbor. How many of you know Arbor or know what we do or have heard of us? Two. That's, that's actually about what I was expecting it to be, yeah. So, um, Arbor Networks was founded um, back in the year 2000 um, um, based on some research at the University of Michigan. Um, the University of Michigan is based in Ann Arbor, and that's where our name comes from. Um, the research in question um, was a part of the DARPA Lighthouse project, which was all about designing algorithms for modelling internet traffic patterns and then detecting changes in those traffic patterns. And what we were really looking for was things like DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks, flash crowds, major routing reconvergence, um, anything that could impact the availability of internet services. When that research had concluded, it was decided that what had been created was of commercial quality, and hence Arbor was born. Over the last 14 years, we've obviously evolved in terms of technology, in terms of product, in terms of people, and also in terms of revenue. And from a business perspective, uh, possibly one of the highlights of our history would be our acquisition by Danaher Corporation back in 2010. Uh, Danaher, a major um, US conglomerate, um, revenues in 2012 were around $18 billion. Um, and you know they've given us a lot of financial backing effectively. They've kind of left us autonomous from an operational perspective, but what they have done is invest in us, and that's allowed us to grow in terms of the number of people that we have, and it's also allowed us to broaden our product portfolio to address a wider market space. And they've also enabled us to um, acquire some additional technologies to use within um, our product. So, uh, for example, we acquired a company called Packetly just before Christmas, who were a big data security analytics startup. From a technical perspective, Arbor is best known as the market leading provider of DDoS, distributed denial of service attack detection and mitigation solutions for both enterprises and service providers. We have a fairly dominant market share in the carrier, mobile, and enterprise spaces there. Interestingly, um, though, if you go and talk to our customers about where they get value from our solutions, most of them would actually tell you that they get at least as much value from the traffic monitoring and reporting side of our solutions um, as they do from the threat detection and mitigation functionality that we offer. But we are best known as a vendor of threat detection and mitigation solutions. One of our key strengths actually is in our research capability around that threat detection and you know, how threats are evolving and how to deal with those threats. We were founded based on research and we stay very true to that. Uh, the Arbor research team, our research team, spend all of their time looking at how the internet is evolving, how threats are evolving, and how threats are actually using compromised infrastructure to attack their own internet. One of the key ways in which we do that is using a tool known as Atlas. Um, Atlas is a key unique to Arbor in that it's the only globally scope threat analysis system in existence, and it gives us a broad view of what's going on right across the internet. We can then drill down into that view to get very granular information on what's actually going on out there. Just to kind of throw some numbers at you, um, towards the end of last year, Atlas was tracking data that represented about 80 terabits per second of internet traffic. And we think that's roughly about a third of everything that's going on out there. So we do have a really unique view as to what's going on, and increasingly we're using that information to derive actionable intelligence data that um, our customers uh, and the broader operational security community can use to defend themselves from the threats out there today. 
I'm not here today though uh, to talk about um, research that's derived internally from ACER or some. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm not here to talk about ACER research or Atlas data or that kind of thing. I'm here to talk about uh, some research that we've sponsored with the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, for those of you who haven't come across the EIU before, um, they're all about providing research information to business leaders to kind of help them make decisions about the threats that they face and also about the opportunities that they might actually be able to take. This piece of research was all about gauging the level of corporate preparedness to dealing with cybersecurity incidents. And we asked organisations, you know, what kinds of incidents they were seeing, how frequently they were seeing them, how they prepared to deal with them, where they felt least and most confident about those preparations, and also how they felt they could better prepare to deal with the threats they were actually facing. Before I go any further, I should probably qualify a little bit here as to what we actually meant by a cybersecurity incident as it comes well, as it pertains to this piece of research. And what we're really talking about here is any intentional or unintentional breach of an organization's, uh, of an organization's security um, that materially affects their ability to do business. The research um, that we're going to be talking through here today took two parts. Firstly, there was a survey of 360 business executives from all around the world. 73% uh, of those were at sea level, and just under a half of them came from organisations with an excess of a half a billion dollars of revenue. So, some fairly big organisations participated in this. In terms of the verticals that were represented, uh, there were 19 different industries, but there were significant um, um, response groups, I suppose, from manufacturing, information technology, professional services, and also finance. Second part of this research is some in-depth interviews with uh, some key industry experts and things like risk analysis, um, that kind of thing. And what you'll see as we move through this presentation is you'll see some quotes from those individuals and you'll see uh, some kind of comments around what we learned from the interview section of the research. And there's more information than the actual hard copy report from that second section. Please do all come in and sit down. Don't, don't, don't. Loss, regulatory fines, and also you know the impact of loss of trust with customers. 
increasingly in today's world, it's important for organizations to you know, be able to detect and deal with cybersecurity incidents efficiently, to kind of streamline the whole process, reduce the costs, reduce the impact to the business. <coughs> so what I'd like to do now is start off by talking through some of the key findings from the research. And as I mentioned at the start, I'm going to run through these um, fairly quickly and at a fairly high level to begin with. And then I'm going to drill down into more of the raw data um, in a kind of a subsequent uh, section of this presentation. Um, all of the raw data um, in its entirety is actually included in the report that you can download from our website. We have all of the questions and the answer breakouts in the back there. So if you are looking at using some of that data for your own purposes, uh, you, you uh, can download the hard copy report. So what were the key findings um, from this particular piece of research? Well, the first, as I've just mentioned, is something that we can all probably appreciate from our own personal experience, from talking to the OPSEC people within our organisations, and that's that the frequency of incidents is on the rise. What's interesting, though, is that when we asked our civil respondents about the types of incidents that they were actually seeing, um, you know, although 75% of them had seen um, a security incident within the last 12 months, the majority of those incidents weren't actually um, of a malicious nature. The two most common types of incidents were um, accidental outages and um, loss of sensitive data by employees. What this shows us is that when we're looking at implementing incident handling plans and incident handling processes, we have to be careful not to get too focused on uh, the external malicious threats that we hear a lot about. You know, we all hear a lot about APT, cyber espionage, all of these kinds of things from various conferences, from the media, from industry bodies, from our vendors, from our integrators. We have to be careful when we're implementing incident handling plans and processes that the capability that we've put in place can deal with both the internally originated non-malicious threats and also those externally originated malicious threats. You know, we, we, need, we need that broad capability to deal with anything that might actually come up, come up against us. Secondly, the emphasis on, emphasis on incident response is driving the formalization of plans and processes. And what came through very clearly from the survey responses was that um, the business executives we interviewed around the world had, had been really kind of um, grasp the fact that dealing well with a security incident could actually be a differentiator for their organisation. And in fact, over two thirds of our respondents told us that they felt that dealing well with a security incident could actually enhance the reputation of their business. This and a few other factors really does seem to be driving the implementation of incident handling plans and incident handling processes within organisations. And as you can see here, more than 60% of our respondents um, have actually already implemented incident handling plans or incident, incident handling processes in some guise. Thirdly, most organisations rely on external providers to assist with incident response. And this is all about assessing not just where our strengths and capabilities are when we're looking at incident handling plans, but also looking at where our weaknesses and our limitations are. It's important to identify those as well so that we can fill those gaps when we need to, potentially with assistance from external organisations. And as you can see here, 70% of our respondents told us that they have um, contracted with external organisations um, to get help during incident response. The two most common areas where they've done that were in um, specialist IT organisations, um, IT forensics, things like that, and also um, with uh, legal organisations to help with the fallout cybersecurity incidents. What was also interesting in this particular area was that um, organisations that had experienced a security incident within the last 12 months were actually twice as likely to have put these kinds of, con um, these kind of contracts in place than those who actually haven't. And you know, that may indicate that you know, those who have experienced incidents have kind of um, learned the hard way to an extent that they had some limitations in their capability and needed external help. Moving on, um, the level of preparedness within organisations is being held back by a lack of understanding about the threats that are actually out there. On a positive note, nearly three quarters of our survey respondents told us that um, they're at least somewhat prepared to deal with cyber security incidents, but there is significant room for improvement here. Only 17% of our respondents actually told us that they felt fully prepared, and in some regions the number was even lower than that. APAC, for example, it was down at 12%. In terms of the areas where people were least confident about their capabilities, it was in being able to predict the business impact of an incident early on in the handling cycle, 
I'm also being able to actually detect the incident uh, <coughs> within 24 hours, the way in which um, organizations felt they could better prepare for dealing with incidents, the top way was actually in getting a better understanding of the threats that are actually out there. And that's a very easy thing to say, but it can be a quite difficult thing to do. It can be difficult for organizations to get um, the right level of information at the right frequency that they can actually use internally to help tune their defenses, help protect themselves from the threats that they actually face. And I'll be talking about you know, where we can get data, where we can get intelligence information in more detail as we move through the rest of this presentation. Next, um, automated detection of incidents is growing in importance with employees remain vital. And in fact, the most common way in which our survey respondents told us they detected security breaches was actually by being notified by their employees. They were actually the most common way that this actually happened. And they were tied at number one with routine checks and controls, so, you know, throwing out something unusual. Automated detection systems were only responsible for detecting about a third of the security incidents that our survey respondents um, actually experienced. And you know, to an extent, that's a surprise, given the you know the, the focus that most organisations have on automated detection systems. On the other hand, though, it is kind of um, understandable, or that level of focus is understandable, because um, automated detection systems kind of help us to address two of the areas where um, businesses felt least confident in their preparation. So, automated detection systems can detect threats very quickly. That helps with one area. And they also tend to present very consistent data about what's actually happened, and that can help organisations predict the business impact of any security incident. So I think we will continue to see this focus on automated detection systems, and we'll probably see the percentage of events that are detected moving upwards in subsequent years. The other thing I think that will maintain focus on these systems is some of the regulatory frameworks that may be coming down the line in um, various regions that will mandate the reporting of um, security incidents within fairly short time frames. And again, that will move the focus onto these systems that deliver that data, deliver that threat detection capability more quickly. Moving on, um, firms remain reticent about disclosing um, incidents and sharing intelligence about threats. And what came through very, very clearly from this research was that the majority of the respondents do not share threat intelligence data unless they're legally obliged to do so. There were some verticals where things were obviously a bit better, so higher education and finance. Um, they were pretty good at sharing information. Um, everywhere else, it was very, very patchy indeed. And in fact, um, only one in three of our respondents told us that they voluntarily share threat intelligence data in Western Europe, that was down to one in four. So those are the kind of key findings um, from uh, the research at a fairly high level. What I'd like to do now is drill down into some of these in a bit more detail so that you can see more of the underlying data, some of the underlying statistics, and kind of um, understand how we got to some of those key findings. So the first of them, incidents are increasing in frequency. As I mentioned before, um, you know, we can all see that from our own experience from you know, simply looking at the mainstream media. And that came through very, very clearly in the survey responses. Almost a third of our survey respondents told us that they'd seen more security incidents in 2013 than they had done in 2012. And that's a concern because, you know, along with the increase in frequency of security incidents, the costs for dealing with security and um, in, um, with security incidents are also um, growing. This study didn't actually look at the costs of dealing with security incidents, but there are plenty of papers out there that do. Um, things like the Ponemon Institute's cost of cybercrime study for 2013, for example, I think that showed that there was roughly about a, I think it was a 25% increase in the cost of dealing with incidents from 2012 to 2013. So for organisations, there's kind of a double whammy here, I suppose, in that on the one hand, there are more incidents going on, and on the other hand, um, the cost of dealing with those incidents is also increasing. What's really important here is for organisations to know their enemy. And this really does come back um, to what I said before about implementing broad capabilities, broad processes, broad plans to deal with the different types of threats that we might actually face. We have to be careful not to get too focused on external malicious threats um, that we hear about all the time, APT, cyber espionage, things like that. Because as I mentioned before, the two most common types of threats were accidental major disruptions and loss of sensitive data by employees. 
actually one in four of our survey respondents told us that they'd seen an accidental major system disruption in 2013. And the costs of those incidents can be just as high as the malicious outages. Um, look at RBS as an example. You know, I think they set aside something like 125 million pounds to cover the cost of you know, their outage, and that wasn't malicious at all. So what's really key here is being prepared to respond. As I said, putting capabilities in place that can deal with the different types of incidents that we might um, be facing. And it is very important <coughs> in the business world to deal with incidents well. Two thirds of our respondents told us that they actually felt that dealing well with an incident could actually enhance the reputation of their business. And you can use you know, that to some degree in things like business plans, um, ROI plans, to actually justify the implementation of incident handling plans and incident handling teams. So, you know, it is really, really important that we do get this stuff right now. Moving on to looking at the plans that we have in place and our own capabilities, again, as I mentioned before, it is very important to understand where our strengths and our capabilities are, but it's equally important and perhaps more important to understand where our limitations and weaknesses might be. 70% of our, of our respondents told us that they contract with external <coughs> organisations to help them during security incidents. And actually for the largest organisations that responded to the survey, that number was up at 80%. The two most common areas will be no surprise to anybody, IT forensics and also legal organisations to help with the fallout from cyber security incidents. What was also interesting in this particular area was that um, a number of the organisations um, that were interviewed and responded here um, kind of told us that they were looking at insurance products to help protect themselves from the, 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 uh, the costs and impact of cyber security incidents. One of the interviewees um, for the second stage of this research was a guy from uh, Marsh Risk Consulting. And they told us that in North America, they'd seen roughly a 33% increase in the interest in these kinds of insurance products from 2012 to 2013. And they felt that was being driven by um, increased regulation, by increased contractual pressure to have insurance cover in place, and also, unfortunately, by increased experience of cybersecurity incidents from the organisations that they were talking to. The organisations that were most interested in these kinds of insurance products were the ones that... Um, we're dealing with the most personal information, so you know, higher education, healthcare, uh, e-commerce, and of course, um, finance. And um, you know, the costs of losing customer personal information can be quite quantifiable. You know, you can look at what the regulatory fine structures are, and you can also look at what the historical um, costs of litigation have been in various instances. So, you know. Um, it, 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 it is something that can be quantified and therefore you can play the costs of what the insurance is likely to be off against the costs of what the uh, potential impact or breach could actually be. One thing they did also tell us there though is that although there is increased interest in these kinds of insurance products, um, the market penetration is not that high. Um, so in North America they reckon it was about 25%, <coughs> in the rest of the world they reckon down at low single digits. Another interesting thing that came out of this particular area of the research was in what we can expect um, from our major business partners. You know, those, are, those, those organizations that we work with that may have extra net access, things like that. Um, and what came through there was, you know, only a half of our respondents told us that they actually thought um, their major business partners would notify them of a security incident that might actually affect them. And another 29% said that they weren't sure. So I think in the future, I think it would be more important for us to kind of formalise these relationships with our major business partners about, you know, what our expectations are. You know, do we expect them to notify us um, of an incident on their network that might impact, you know, some of our data? Do we expect them to assist us and cooperate with us when we're investigating an incident on our network that leads that kind of leads us to a system on their network? I think we'll need to kind of formalise those arrangements a bit so that you know people do know better about what's going to happen in this. On a more positive note, um, nearly three quarters of our respondents um, are at least somewhat prepared for dealing with a security incident. Um, but as I said before, there is a room for improvement here, with only 17% saying that they felt fully prepared. Again, positively though, over 90% of the companies that actually had an incident handling plan or an incident handling team in place felt that they could deal with a security incident if it happened today. And that contrasts with only a third of organisations who didn't have an incident handling plan or an incident handling team in place. 
One thing that, again, I'm sure you're all aware of is that, um, you know, the threats that face us are evolving very quickly, especially the kind of external malicious kind. Um, to an extent, that kind of needs to be echoed in our instant handling plans. You know, they need to be reviewed regularly, and they need to be tested regularly in, you know, realistic scenarios. Unfortunately, um, people's view of regularly tends to differ quite widely, um, and this has actually come through in quite a few different bits of research that we've done. Um, just to kind of give you an example, I suppose, every year Arbor does something called the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report, which is um, a survey of the kind of broader operational security community. So every September and October we go out with a questionnaire to the OPSEC community, they respond, and then in January we publish the, you know, the annual infrastructure security report. This January was the ninth iteration of that report. And what that told us about this was that 55% of the respondents there never actually um, test their incident handling processes. And again, I think that's something that really is going to have to improve in the, in the uh, future. And in fact, if you look at the ways in which organisations felt they could better prepare themselves for dealing with cybersecurity incidents, testing existing preparations came in at number three. The two top ways in which organisations felt they could better prepare were better understanding of potential threats and raising awareness of existing preparations. Getting a better understanding of potential threats, as I said before, sounds very simple it can actually be quite hard to do. Where do you get that kind of information on? Uh, if, uh, from? Where do you get the right levels of information? Because obviously you can get maybe uh, actionable intelligence data that you can use within automated detection systems. But you may also need kind of threat-proof data so that you can educate people as to the kinds of threats that are happening out there in the vertical, how they work, what to look for, all of those kinds of things. So it's important to establish relationships as an organisation with industry bodies, with regional CERT teams, um, and, and things like that. Sources of good information, sources who have a broader level of visibility of what's going on out there. And it's also important when you're selecting vendors and integrators um, to kind of, you know, bring into the equation what kind of visibility those vendors and integrators have, and also look at, you know, how willing they are to share refined intelligence data about what they can actually see going on. When we come to raising awareness of existing preparations, this is really all about empowering people that are involved in incident handling plans and incident handling teams to go out and educate the organisation as to what's actually being done, what processes exist, how can they help with them, who's involved in those processes. If you see something suspicious, who should you go and talk to about it? It's really, really important to have that you know, broad level of knowledge about what an organisation's capabilities actually are. Again, on a positive note, planned incident response is the new norm, with more than 60% of our respondents telling us that they have an incident handling plan or an incident handling team in place. So that's a very positive spin on that stat. Uh, the more negative spin is that there are 40% who don't have an incident handling plan or an incident handling team in place. And, um, you know, that, 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 that number is actually better than I thought it was going to be, which is why I explained it positively. But 40% is still quite a big number. Um, and I would expect um, you know, that number to decrease over time. So I expect the, the number of, or the percentage of organisations to have done something to prepare for cyber security incidents to continue growing over the next few years, especially given you know, um, the increased frequency in events, the media coverage of events, and the potentially huge costs of getting this kind of thing wrong. In terms of who leads incident handling within organisations, in the larger organisations that responded to the survey, and there was a fairly well-defined split here, it was actually IT. In the smaller organisations, it was general management, and that seemed to be down to um, whether the organisations had a large enough IT department, or whether there was enough seniority in that IT department to really actually get things done. What was also interesting here was that a close to a half of our survey respondents told us that they formally classify incidents as soon as they're detected. That has its pros and its cons, um, from, from my perspective, I suppose. Um, on the pro side, you can implement incident handling plans that are very tailored to individual incident types. They can obviously be more efficient, uh, they, they, they can obviously be kind of more efficient, more streamlined, they can hopefully reduce the cost and the impact to the business. The negative side is that you have to be careful not to be too reliant on individual silo processes, because if you are entirely reliant on silo processes and you get something that doesn't fit into one of your categories, people don't know what to do. 
So it is useful to have specific processes to deal with specific incident types, but it's also important to make sure that whoever's involved in incident handling has a broad view of the capabilities the organisation has and can reapply those capabilities um, as they need to based on what's actually confronting them, that we don't get you know, tied into specific processes in the ER. In terms of incident protection, as I mentioned before, in 46% of uh, the incidents that were detected by our survey respondents, it was their employees that actually notified them. And this again comes back to kind of re-emphasise the point that it is very important to educate employees both about the threats that are out there, so that they can be even more effective in detecting breaches, and also um, about educating them around the plans and capabilities that are in place, because if they know um, who to interact with, how to interact with the incident handling process, they're more likely to actually do so. Tied at number one were routine checks and controls, um, you know, throwing up something unusual, as I said before. Automated detection systems um, were actually at number three, responsible for detecting about a third of the security incidents that our respondents actually, um, actually saw. But again, as I said before, you know, they're useful in dealing with two of the ways in which organisations start least confident about their capability. Um, the number one there was being able to predict the impact of um, an incident to an organisation's business. And number two was um, being able to detect an incident within 24 hours. Automated detection systems can obviously detect very quickly, and they usually provide consistent data, which makes predicting the overall impact of an incident um, simpler. So, you know, there will continue to be a focus there, I think. <coughs> one interesting comment that came in from one of our interviewees was um, that, you know, they felt that it's important for organisations to have these automated detection systems, especially as some of the, you know, regulatory frameworks require more rapid incident notification, but it's important for us not to get too reliant on them, because if we have a well-resourced um, attacker coming at us, it is entirely possible that they could get hold of the same threat detection systems that we have. And if they do that, there are, you know, there, you know, there is the potential that they could work out ways to actually get around them. And I'm sure many of you would have seen lots of things on YouTube that say how to get around various different types of security infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> moving on to look at the top way in which organisations um, were least confident about their preparations, 49% felt that, um, that they weren't confident in their ability to predict the business impact of a security incident. And from my perspective, again, I think this comes down to understanding the threats that are out there and getting salient information early on in an incident handling cycle about what's actually happened. You know, if we know about the different types of threats that are out there, if we know about what they generally do, what's happened in other instances, and we have enough information early on in the incident handling cycle to be able to identify all of those things, then we should be able to predict the business impact. But it really is all about getting the right level of information into an organisation and using that information effectively. One thing, of, one area in which organisations can actually help themselves um, is in um, sharing of data um, within, um, within verticals and also across verticals. But only about one in three of our survey respondents told us that they actually do this. And in Western Europe, it was down at one in four. Now, within the operational security and the information security community, sharing of data is fairly well recognised as something that's good. Um, but it doesn't appear to be um, well recognised as something that's good across quite a lot of industries. As I said before, higher education and finance um, are pretty good at this. And in fact, you know, there have been some fairly big exercises which have looked at how organisations cooperate in certain verticals. So, uh, finance, for example, we had uh, Lincoln Shark last year in the UK and Quantum Dawn in the US, and they were partially at least about how organisations share data around threats, and they were very useful. But outside of those verticals, uh, it really is very, very patchy. And organisations do appear to be quite concerned about um, what they're willing to share where they're willing to share it based on you know, the level of impact there might be if they say the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. When we're looking at you know, public disclosure of security incidents, um, you know, it seems to be coming, well, what seems to be happening is disclosing earlier and making sure that we disclose salient information, not necessarily everything, seems to be being viewed better in the media than not disclosing earlier and then have something you need to <coughs> day to day. That seems to be much more damaging. Um, but what we're talking about here when we're talking about sharing threat intelligence is really about sharing with closed user groups. So, you know, establishing who you can share with, which cert teams, which industry bodies, 
you know, are there organisations that you can go to to tell them about what you're seeing and also learn about what others are seeing um, without necessarily there being a public disclosure of media breach. There are organisations that can help you do that. As I said, CERT teams, industry bodies, uh, people like Red Sky Alliance, these kinds of things who work with various intelligence agencies with various verticals to um, have vetted secure user groups that, you know, that will hand information around so that we can all learn from what others have seen. So that was a kind of a run through of the key findings again of this particular piece of research. And what I'd like to do now is talk briefly uh, to the conclusions and then talk a little bit about how other can potentially help organisations with some of these conclusions. I think, from my personal perspective, you can kind of summarise these into, into three points. Um, firstly, you know, cyber security incidents are getting um, more common um, and they are becoming more expensive to deal with. But on the positive side of things, more organisations have recognised that. Um, and they have deployed incident handling plans and incident handling teams. We're up to 60% now, as I said before. And I think that will continue to improve um, you know, in the future. The second key point, I think, is that understanding of the threats that we all face is really key. Whether we're talking about um, internally originated non-malicious threats or externally originated malicious threats, it really is important to get a good understanding of what's going on out there. The externally originated malicious stuff, it's important on, to, to actually build relationships, as I said, with CERT teams, industry bodies, um, other organisations that do close user group sharing. Um, and it's also important to select our partners <coughs> and our integrators based around you know, the kinds of information that they have and their willingness to actually share it. For internally originated threats, um, it's really important for organisations to have good sets of policies and processes uh, defined around what is acceptable behaviour within their infrastructure. And it's important that employees don't just understand the uh, policies and processes, but they also understand the potential impact to the business of breaching those. <coughs> what I need, though, is solutions that have a broad view across our user base, so, so that we can then detect um, when policies or processes are actually being breached. Um, again, other research that we've done in the recent past has kind of indicated that um, that's used to, um, BYOD as an example. Um, lots of organisations allow employees to use their own devices on their networks. Many of them have policies to find out what you can and can't do, cloud synchronisation, copying data, all of these kinds of things. Um, more than a half of the respondents that we asked whether they actually had any way of monitoring adherence to that policy said no. <coughs> so it's important to have visibility of what's actually going on so that we can identify suspicious or malicious activity wherever it might be occurring on our networks, not just that the network perimeter. And then thirdly, I think we all have to get better at sharing. It's very, very useful to understand the threats that have targeted others within the same vertical market. Um, whether they've been successfully breached or not. You know, if we know how they defended themselves, if we know what did work, if we know what didn't work, we can use that information to better defend ourselves. And I think in the future, we are going to have to get better than this across a broader range of industries. So how can Arbor help? Well, one of Arbor's key strengths, as I said um, right at the start of this presentation, is in our research capability and in our visibility of what's actually going on out there. We were founded based on research and new state, very, very true to that. Um, one of our uh, key uniques is the Arbor Atlas system. And Atlas gives us a very detailed picture of what's actually going on right across the internet. About 290 of our service provider customers provide us with data hourly on the traffic crossing their network boundaries, and also on the kinds of DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks that they're actually seeing. DDoS is probably um, the number one threat to internet service availability um, for businesses. And you know, if your organisation uses the internet to sell products, to offer service, or simply to access cloud-based data and applications, then DDoS is a significant threat to you. What we can do with all of this data is we can collate it and trend it to figure out what's happening, how things are changing, where are attacks going from, where are they going to, all of these different things. And we quite often see some of this data being used in the media when various countries have issues with one another and things like that. Um, that kind of stuff. We, 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 we do tend to provide quite a lot of information to the media around that kind of thing. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, this is a, 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 a unique level of visibility as to what's going on out there. We are happy to share this data with both our customers and with others in the operational security community. So it isn't like we are charging for this stuff. You know, if you're interested in getting hold of data about how traffic patterns are changing, about how DDoS <coughs> are changing, we are happy to share this information. 
one example of how we share this data, um, Google Ideas has something called the Digital Attack Map. Um, you can go to this online and you can see what's going on with DDoS attacks around the world, where, kind of, you know, where the attacks are coming from, where they're going to. Um, they're graphing the top 2% of data that we get on a daily basis. Um, they can't graph any more because there'll just be lines everywhere and we won't be able to see it. But um, it is a nice visualisation of what's actually going on out there and some of the intelligence behind their visualisation tries to extract new stories from around the world that are tied to some of the biggest events as well. So it's quite nice to be able to see what's going on in cyberspace and then tie that to what the real world media coverage actually is. So we are happy to share this information. Um, there's currently around 8,000 <coughs> data in the Google Ideas system, so you can go all the way back to kind of July last year and see what was going on and drill down and all of those kinds of things, and it works really, really well. But it's not just information or DDoS attacks that um, Arbor is happy to share. Um, we also have a very significant malware research capability. Um, we have our own Honeypox deployed in lots of service providers around the world, and we use data from the Atlas system. We also share a lot of information with others in the security space, the new vendors like the extenders, things like that, and like Red Sky Institute, which is one of those closed user groups I was talking about. Um, we currently process around 300,000 samples a day through our infrastructure. Um, that infrastructure is a combination of both um, commercial malware analysis tools and also some homegrown malware analysis tools. And homegrown malware analysis tools are actually getting increasingly important because um, malware these days can be quite sophisticated and some of it can actually, uh, well, some of it actually looks to try and figure out whether it's running inside a commercial malware analysis tool and if it decides that it is, it will either shut down or behave differently to try and throw off your analysis. So having your own um, developed infrastructure um, <coughs> What we're doing here um, is we try and try tie malware samples to individual families, we assess their capabilities, we tag those samples so that we know what they do, how they fit into the, you know, the general scheme of things. And what pops out at the end is an intelligence feed that we can use within our products to help increase their effectiveness at dealing with the threats that are out there today. But we also release threat intelligence briefs. And those threat intelligence briefs talk about the various different kinds of things that are going on out there at the moment. You know, so um, recently we've, we've been releasing briefs around the Dexter and Project Put malware, which is the state of <coughs> targeting point of sale terminals around the world. And we've also been announcing, well, we've also been releasing threat briefs around the big storm of NTP DDoS attacks that have been going on, um, targeting again um, various data centers around the world. Um, so if you go to acert.arbornetworks.com, you can download quite a few of these intelligence briefs. Some of them go into quite a lot of detail on the malware analysis, how the malware works, what it looks like, what you would need to look for on your network um, should you be you know, compromised by this stuff. Some of the threat briefs though don't make it onto the website um, and we do only send some of them to um, certain verticals, we don't make them public and that's usually if we don't want the attackers to know what we know about what's going on, if you kind of see what I mean, that would be counterproductive. But if you are interested in this stuff, as I said, do um, get in touch with us. We are happy to share a lot of this information. One of the key ways in which we use this stuff for our own products, though, is in the intelligence feeds that we provide. Um, our Prevail APS solution, which is a network perimeter DDoS detection and mitigation solution, uses an, an Atlas intelligence feed to deal with the latest kinds of application layer DDoS attacks. Our Prevail NSI solution, which is about um, securing the inside of the network, uses an Atlas intelligence feed to um, by communications to known compromised infrastructure out there on the internet. One of the key differences between our threat intelligence feeds and those from other organizations, or three of the key differences, um, are firstly that we include very granular data, um, and that's to try and minimize false positives and also to minimize false negatives. What we also did fairly early on um, was make a decision to use data on a broad range of behaviors. So, um, some intelligence feeds tend to focus on one particular aspect of malware behavior, so you'll find that all of the data in there relates to how command and control works, or something like that. Um, we decided to go the other way. So what we do when we assess malware is we assess everything that it does, and then we incorporate intelligence data on all of those different behaviors, because our take was the more data you've got, the more likely you are to be able to identify potential compromise. And then the third thing that we do, which is possibly the most important, um, is that we tie intelligence information to individual malware families and we also tie the data to confidence intervals. Um, what we're trying to do here is allow organizations to 
configure their threat detection systems around their current risk profiles. So, for example, if you're a financial institution and you know that there's a current attack campaign um, targeting financial institutions, you may decide to turn up the sensitivity of your system for intelligence that relates to that particular kind of threat. You might be willing to use data with a lower confidence interval because of that current phoning threat. Yeah. And what I'm talking about when I'm um, talking about confidence intervals is really about um, if you can imagine that, say, a drop site out there on the internet that's used for data exfiltration, let's say we see it being used every day for the last seven days. Our confidence that today that site is still, co is still compromised is going to be fairly high. If we saw it being used every day for seven days a month ago and we haven't seen it being used at all since then, our confidence needs to be markedly lower because there's a significant chance that that machine has been uh, kind of tied <coughs> in depth. So we include that kind of information in the intelligence thing, as I said, to allow organisations to you know, make their own decisions around how they configure their systems um, as appropriate to their risk profiles. Once you've got threat intelligence data, um, what's equally important is how you use it. Um, a lot of our security solutions tend to focus very narrowly on our network perimeters. I mean, obviously that is where we touch the big bad internet, so you know, that is a potential um, area of risk for us. But in modern network and service architectures, our network perimeters can be very porous. You know, we all have um, smart devices, we all take our tablets and our laptops home, we plug them in outside of our perimeter security solutions and we take them back inside again. We also have extranet connectivity, a whole range of things that poke loads of holes in our network perimeters. And increasingly it's becoming important to have a broad level of visibility and threat detection capability right across our organisations. One of the most cost effective ways of doing that is to use something called Flow. Most of the routers and switches that are deployed within our network infrastructures support something called Flow in various different guises. What um, Flow is, is really the ability for a router or switch to export a summary of the uh, traffic that it's forwarding across the network. <coughs> Solutions such as Arm's Prevail NSI can consume that flow to build up a, a, a complete picture of what's actually happening right across a network. And we can do that very cost effectively because the probes are effectively the infrastructure you already have, which makes up the network. What we then do is correlate the threat intelligence data that we have from the ACER team with that broad picture of what's going across and going on across your network, across your user base. And in that way, we can identify suspicious or malicious behaviours wherever they might be occurring. What Arbor is really all about from a solutions perspective um, is optimising the effectiveness <coughs> of the existing resources that you have within an organisation. All of our solutions are really designed around being able to identify threats, analyse threats, and then remediate them as quickly as possible. Um, we kind of took the decision again fairly early on that um, we don't want to produce solutions that generate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alerts on a daily basis. Um, OPSEC people have lots of solutions that do that. And what tends to happen then is they tend to only get used retrospectively. This has almost, you know, happened in, well, this has kind of happened to IDSs to an extent. And uh, people tend to use IDS logs now after they know that they've had a breach so that they can go back and look at it to figure out what actually happened. Um, what we're trying to do is proactive threat detection and mitigation. So what we're trying to do here is provide um, operational security resources with a way of assessing their current situation, detecting threats. When they detect a threat, having the relevant context and forensic information quickly to hand so that they can prioritise what they address first and quickly understand the business impact of that particular incident so that they can remediate accordingly. So what we've tried to do is focus our products on, um, you know, well, the workflow within our products on fitting into best practices to the So that's pretty much all I have to say today. Um, no product stuff or anything. So do we have any questions? Thank you, by the way. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Uh, you talked about it being a global site. Can you tell us how many um, uh, users you have to do? There are 360 interviewees, and I've got a slide on that. Uh, survey respondents, it's, and that's the geographic spread. Um, the actual report itself, itself, if you download it, has the vertical <coughs> spread as well. 
uh, for, different in, for different industries, but because they were 19, um, I did try and put a graph on the slide, but you can't read it. So. Yes? Did you ask the um, respondents whether they actually had English? Yes. Um, and there's one slide that said none in the last month. You had a response. You had a response. So 75%. 75% of our respondents uh, told us that they've experienced the incident in the last five months. So, so, did you ask them? Were there any incidents? I guess that's where I would go. Oh, never. How um, we have a bunch of them. By virtue of the fact that we've seen 75 that, well, in the last 12 months, I would assume that that would mean that 25% didn't see the incident in the last 12 months. We did actually ask over the last two years as well. So you can see the differential between 2012 and 2013. I don't have those stats at hand on the fridge. I didn't quite memorize them. I did quite memorize the local numbers, but not very well. <coughs> so did you do any follow-up investigation on these companies that said that they had no attack in the last 12 to 24 months to see if actually there had been an attack and they just hadn't detected it? Um, no. So we didn't do the surveys ourselves. We used the economists to do that, and they used their relationships with the organisations to send out survey questionnaires, survey questionnaires, chase them, interview people, get the data back. And we didn't do any follow-up, no. And I think, to an extent, I'm not entirely sure that as Arbor we're actually allowed to as a part of the kind of the whole relationship or the contractual thing between us and the economists that I think we're allowed to chase their interview meetings. Sorry, Luke, we have a question down here. It's very interesting you said about um, organisations voluntarily and sharing things. Yes. Um, we'll try I, I, I think that's a very sweeping generalisation. Yeah. 